school board budget work session um, February 5th, 2015. Will the board members who are present please respond, Mr. Sturman, Ms. Gray, Mr. Bowman? Here. Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Hassan, Dr. Jones? Here. Mrs. King, yes. Mr. Coleman, Mrs. Larson? Here. We do not have a plan, Madam Chair. I believe we want to start with 2.02 and mm -hmm. discuss the superintendent's proposed 2015 2016 general fund and see if so, board members, um, if you're okay with this, we will wait to do the public comment um, period until we have a full quorum, and right now we'll move forward with our budget discussions. Sure. Okay. All right. Okay, good evening. Okay. Um, we put together a few topics to review this evening, as well as walking through um, a spreadsheet of all of the key decision points in the general fund budget process, um, trying to get a consensus on which items to be forward on. Obviously, we don't have um, a consensus of board members here, so we'll walk through those um, with the members who are present. Um, this is an ongoing topic list. The top items were furnished to you at our work session on January 28th. Three new items are being furnished this evening based on um, some requests that were made at the January 28th work session. And we still are working on a few um, items for future discussion. Um, the first item, which I won't go into in great detail because you have not had an opportunity to review it. I believe it was Mr. Sturdivant who asked um, regarding the list of vacancies that we had sorted by they vacated or a length of time vacant. If we, we could add um, dollar amounts to those, so we did that. Um, and we've also provided some updates. There have been some vacancies that were identified as filled, either at your Monday night meeting or previously. Um, so those are highlighted in, in yellow for your review. And we have color coded. Um, in green, the maintenance vacancies that are already targeted for elimination by Mr. Cranston's maintenance proposal for your review. And then there are some um, teaching positions that we have um, highlighted in various colors. Um, speech OT vacancies, which again are very hard to staff nationally and state. Um, so we are currently using contracted services to provide those services to students. Um, the um, purple or light blue shaded are special needs teachers that are vacant, and then and the purple shading are just general teachers, teaching positions that are vacant. And then we have um, some library media. So we just kind of recap the teaching positions that are in the um, There are also a couple, a couple more categories here that we highlighted for your review. Bus operators in particular, and then the I believe those are nurses, which again have been identified as a part of staff area. Um, we have some more information regarding the nurse salary comparison. But wanted to call that to your attention. Don't really have any to specifically speak to you, and I know you haven't had an opportunity to review the dollar amounts. Mr. Boyd. What level of these vacancies are you seeing in the state of the research? The green, the green highlighted, um, the maintenance positions have been targeted for elimination. At this point, no other positions have been targeted for elimination. So are we, I mean, other than those, um, which all things being equal, um, I trust Mr. Prince that the same level of services are medically provided with those reductions. Um, sorry about that. Um, but are, so holding positions vacant allows for additional savings. Whether we eliminate those or not could be a decision that's down the road later. Have we assumed any of that type of vacancy savings? Um, you know, made a strategic decision to hold the position, hold positions open longer? 
No, I, I don't believe we have any strategically. Um, we, we're not holding any vacancies strategically. The ones that have been vacant um, for the longest one here are um, some of the special special needs um, positions. I believe there is an auditor position that has been vacant, and I can't speak to you know why that has been vacant as long as it has. But the speech highlighted areas in particular are speech pathologists and OT. We certainly have those needs and have need of that service, and we are using contracted service as vendor to provide that service in the absence of having someone employed full time. We keep the position open in the budget because it is our wish to hire a permanent person, but we end up shifting those dollars, salaries and benefits into the contracted services line through a budget transfer throughout the year to, to provide the services by contracted services. Any other questions? So, board members, let's um, go back to the original agenda and open up for the public comments for the capital improvement plan. Then do another 78, which actually would be larger 
the number because we would not have any uh, special education budgets. Buses would cost most. And so on the regular ed buses, we would hopefully get above 78 if we were to do this million dollar aid, we would do that million dollar request. And then the technology side, we have to address the wireless in our inside our schools, and we have to address the intercom system. And so the $4.7 million is a reflection of those two components. And going forward into 17, we've taken the things we know from a roof standpoint, the lease payments. We know that we're going to have to replace our AC system that use R22 refrigerant because it goes away, as we've discussed. Um, and we know there's going to be needs, but without identifying specific schools, um, we put in placeholders and estimated amounts. But these are just low ball type numbers. I would anticipate that those numbers will go up when we do it school by school and year by year.
And then that'll be shown in your next report on 15 because it's going to occur in FY15. Okay. So the, the cost of us taking Clark Springs, basically, which has been what fault, or you know, brought to a, an inactive state, will bring it to an active state. So we'll obviously incur some expenses for cleaning it and bringing it back up to that state. Um, and we will incur some expenses to do this as quickly as we are from you know, L Clark to uh, Clark Springs and moving it. Those will be shown in the next report, but that's part of, that'll be a FY15 project and use FY15 CIJ. Okay. Will, will it require special handling um, with that the furniture, um, we, we've, you know, spoken with the health department um, and our professionals from the environmental side, <coughs> and um, we're all very confident that we can move that furniture in a safe manner without cost. We will, to be prudent and be proactive, um, anything that we move from Elkhart to Clark Springs will actually be washed down um, to ensure that if there are any spores on the on that equipment. And remember, for a spore to attach to something, it has to be something that is organic. Okay? And a lot of our desks and all are not organic material. But to be safe and to be proactive, which has driven everything that we try to do here over the last 24 hours um, and to ensure the safety of our staff and our students, we'll actually do a wash down at Elkhart before we move it to the part of the moving process. Excellent. I just want to say thank you for all of the work that you've put into this, all of the extra additional testing that you've put forward to get those kids out of that building so safely. And I uh, also want to take the time to thank my colleague Ms. Teach PPS for um, alerting the school board of the whole and that you get informed um, as this is a ninth district school and I just want to say that her due diligence is very much appreciated. Well I, I appreciate that but let me let me um, add that this was a team effort. Um, there's not one person that can pull all this off. So it's been a team which is I think the strength of, of what Dr. Bedden has built here and um, that there is a team and it's been a, a collaborative effort of everybody as well as the city um that everybody I, I, i've been very proud of how everybody has worked together um today for example um at clark springs where all this went down last night um this morning uh parks and rec had their crews um, at clark springs i was there at about eight o'clock and there was between 10 to 15 people four large pieces of equipment and work was already beginning um, in addressing the outside area and then our team came. But you saw what can be done when we all work together as a team and I just want to stress it's a team. I appreciate it, but it is a team. I appreciate it. I just want to just follow up with, you know, you included me in the process, especially with this being the district school that they're moving into across Springs. And I can ask questions 50 million different ways Thank you. All I can do is work on Thank you, Mr. Grant. All right, um, board members, what we need to do tonight is just um, get some consensus that this budget is where we want to go, and then we'll do a formal vote at our next board meeting. So can I get some head nods or something? All right, excellent. Thank you. All right, um, Adam Clark. Are we back on the budget? Okay. Okay, so nobody wants to give any public comment. All right.
were discussing the vacancy listing, I believe that um, our, after the superintendent's mm -hmm. presentation of the estimate of needs, um, a board member had specifically requested a listing of vacant positions, which we furnished at the first work session of January 28th. Um, And at um, the January 28th work session, we were asked to furnish you all with uh, dollar information regarding each of these vacant positions, which we are providing for you tonight. In addition to the dollar amounts, we um, have contacted um, some positions just, just for your review um, and have categorized certain vacancies. Um, any, any further questions regarding that document? I know we have not had an opportunity to review it, and we're certainly happy to entertain your questions um, prior to the next work session or the next meeting. Um, I, I don't have a question. Okay. I, and I Maybe it's in here, but you know, I, there's a lot of colors and yes. notes and stuff. Yes. Is there a have? Are you all making any sort of recommendation here? Like, here are ten positions we could eliminate. Here are yes. 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 presently we are not making a recommendation for elimination. Okay. Um, we can certainly review this with um, Dr. Bennett's cabinet to see if there are any that stand out to them as potential eliminations. But the items, again, colored in green, okay. are targeted. Those are the only ones at this point. Okay. I mean, Mr. Moore. No, I think that's a, a good question, uh, given that these are vacancies. And um, I'd like to see sort of what a recommendation would look like um, from the appropriate department manager person. Exactly, and what impact it would have on services. Um, we, we have tagged a few of these <coughs> as how that service is being provided now through the long-term sub or contracted services situation. A number of the IT positions that are vacant are um, presently being um, filled or we're using contracted services. To okay, so you'll and, and we will um, you work next. on a priority yes. list for us. Okay. Yes. okay. The next item that we have for your review, I believe um, Ms. Larson had asked for um, a comparison of the nurses' salaries in the area. And Dr. Boyd actually um, emailed you some information in your Friday report um, this past Friday. However, um, we made a correction here. The um, midpoint of our salaries here was actually furnished to you as the maximum for that Friday um, report. So we, we did want to furnish you with the actual maximum salary for um, RNs in Richmond. This compares Richmond to Genrico, Hanover, and Portsmouth. Chesterfield um, currently uses the Public Health Department, and I believe um, Dr. Boyd's staff is looking for seeking additional information from Chesterfield. Norfolk is also transitioning from the Public Health Department to school board appointed personnel for nurses. And we are also awaiting a private sector comparison information to, to update this slide. But just for the districts that we've compared ourselves to, we do exceed Hanover's salary ranges. And we are 12 to 30 percent below in RICO, which we are in most of our positions. And we are comparable to Portsmouth at the maximum, but 18% below than at the minimum starting salary range. Um, I believe Ms. Larson, when she submitted her budget um, document, had asked that we look at providing a um, signing bonus or some type of an incentive for hard to staff positions. So we will be working with HR and also doing <coughs> the state listing of hard to fill positions and coming up with an appropriate recommendation. There are um, some incentives outlined in the academic improvement plan as well. But um, they, they are probably doing more toward instruction and, and support things such as nurses. But this is for your review and information. Um, we are comparable to Hanover, <coughs> or I've seen Hanover, and comparable to Portsmouth and the conference and the Um Ms. Larson. Ms. Epps. With regard to our nursing staff, is it correct that we are currently fully staffed? 
we are not that. We have we have folks we have persons in each location, so there's no building that is empty. Um, the Miss Rogers does have some subs and places um, because it's an ongoing turnover. We get staff and some of the time, so it's typical. Okay. On the vacancy report that we actually have, I believe there are three nurses and one nurse's assistant that are included on that vacancy list and nursing this evening and um, there is a substitute for contracting services. So we get
you know, because on the outside we know that you know, half a million dollars can address a pretty serious issue for almost 40%. So I'm, yeah. I'm also thinking about the return on that investment. Sure. So considering the attendance issues that we have with that, the hours of instruction that kids will participate in for a day program, um, the return on that investment is my concern. Well, and, and that is, and, and thank you, Dr. Bennett, because that's part of the whole attendance issue. So, you know, if we say that students have to attend summer school over the summer, what happens when they don't? So is, is, there, a, is there a repercussion that happens? I mean, we certainly don't want to um, put mandates out there that we don't have any teeth that are. So it's a parent prerogative to send a student to school over the summer. So if they don't come, then what do we do? We're still back in the same situation. So that's why part of my opinion has to do with what we do with students during the 10 months of the school year that we have to have. Um, in, in many instances, we, we charge families for summer school, correct? Some, some programs, some of the high school courses, uh, they're charged if a student is out of the city um, area, city region, then we charge a tuition. But uh, a large degree of our summer programs, particularly for elementary and middle school students, is Title I. So we're not charging those families. And I, I just asked that because I was going to ask a follow-up question. Does it make sense for us to allot or budget some money for those families that need to go to summer school but can't afford it. Yes. And do you, is it, is it uh, pushing the big boulder up the hill and figure out trying to just guess whether it's on the back of a napkin or whatever what the universe might be of those types of families or what a good number to have available? For I can get that for you. An estimate. Yeah. And yeah. Sam, the same would, uh, year-round schools maybe have any impact? So the research says that some year-round schools do have an impact. There are several different tracks that year-round schools can take, um, and some of the research does support that it makes a difference. And part of the reason is not only because it is continued um, uh, education, but it is the intervention and the enrichment that happens during some of those breaks, those intercessions, that uh, really helps to boost students and prevent some of that summer slide that we get. Okay. Related, so related to the budget, uh, I know that uh, we should be or should have concluded a study at MLK, Dr. Bud, for year round school. They, uh, Ms. King can speak to that a little bit. It'll be coming in the March 2nd about some major concerns with new teams will identify with it and yet someone pass away. Yes, the, um, the, the lady who was heading up part of that research and, and helped to pen the white paper did pass <coughs> away the holidays. Uh, we found out that some of the work of some of the committees had maybe had not been compiled correctly or, or you know, effectively. Some of the work did get done, so there were surveys that were completed, there were you know some studies and things like that that were done but we really needed to reconvene, and so we did. We put together some teams of folks. Some folks are gone, and we don't know what happened to the work, so we had to reconvene, get some work done together again. Um, so we still are meeting right now, but March, you will have a report. Absolutely. One of the things I think I mentioned this morning that is problematic to me, while we got funding to study this for MLK, in our community is gonna be problematic in that while you look at MLK, what about all of the students there in the same household that go to other school? The feeder path. Petersburg was able to do it easier because there are a few members of school. We don't have that situation, especially with our middle schools that feed uh, you know, three or four elementaries. Uh, so if I got a kid as a parent that may be in MLK going year round, but I got an elementary kid also, they don't have totally different calendars. And so those things have to be which to my knowledge, when I looked at it, it had, I didn't see it that discussed or addressed yet. 
Um, and then, not on the field, but then what happens next when they leave you? Ain't okay. I'm not going to transition back again to a regular one. So all those things are things that jumped out at me that I didn't answer that I didn't see the answer yet. Hello. Um, is anyone from Patrick Henry helping to inform what a year-round calendar looks like? We have the calendar. Okay. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that has to be noted is that Patrick Henry is a, a, a charter and they don't follow the same necessarily curriculum and things like that that we follow so there are some nuances that make it a bit different okay and this, it brings up something else in my mind that uh, we changed the schedule for the middle schoolers this year they're on that four four or something are will we be uh, changing the high schools to that same schedule for this year we had not discussed that that was not a conversation for if you're referencing this MLK study Okay. So we have a group, a subcommittee of uh, folks that are working from the curriculum office that are working on how we have to rewrite the pacing for these courses and how we might be embedding some of the projects and things that students can work on during the session. sessions. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Ms. Larson, do you recall whether or not um, we actually, as a board, voted that we would have the high schoolers by this coming school year mirror the schedule for the middle schoolers or bring us some proposals. Can I, can I ask a question? Is this, and I, I, I know all our time is valuable, we've been here a lot already in this group together, but I mean, I think that that conversation about the bell schedule, unless it has budgetary impact, yeah. is probably the best. It does. it does have budgetary okay. impact. And we can figure it out. We can look back in the minutes. We can, we can go back in the minutes and bring it to the next work session. Thank you. It's not that I always enjoy a good discussion. <laughs> it's our favorite topic. Okay. Ms. Keene, um, board members, do we have any other questions about yeah. summer school? No, so your recommendation is just to keep our budget flat on this outside of the potential, uh, outside of the potential uh, um, tuition uh, fees that we might provide for those families that need, need them. You're just talking about just maintaining the status quo. The, the, and, and maintaining the status quo, no. Okay. We are reworking the summer school. Okay. So the courses, the what children learn, how they learn, we're reworking that. So status quo would not be it. Okay. But my recommendation would not be to um, mandate summer school for every student who is reading below grade level in our district. Okay. Um, is there anything that we can do as a board to help improve attendance at summer school? I mean, is there some sort of in between 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 what we put on this presentation and what we have now that will get children there and keep them there for the four weeks? Well, I think that one of the things is the program. Mm -hmm. So it has absolutely got to be engaging. It cannot be a repeat of what they do during the school year. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have project-based learning. We've got to have kids engaged, hands-on. But we have to do it in alignment with the state standards. So, and, and I'm not poking fingers or anything like that at anything that's been done in the past. But this has to be an intentional effort to really engage the kids in different ways. I think there's a question that Dr. Gordon brought up Ms. Jones also respond to now that teams back to us maybe what if any things they're going to do to do for support doing because remember in the summertime in the truancy it was uh, suspect they were for us so there are probably going to be consideration to what her team we can care or will be able to do to support target 
down to serve the district in a very small vote. So she might want to bring some commentary for it and also ask her, where is your status for the city? So, because I can't remember there. Not there. Well, how many months have they staffed? Uh, most of them, I believe, are nine and a half months. There are so some. So we might want to look at, do we need to give her funding to make sure she has a core team that focuses just on that uh, in the summer? And that's something we haven't really thought about. I'm sure they should. Dr. Jones. And just a real final question. Uh, <clears throat> for the changes that you are talking about making to some school, for upgrades, are they being budgetary implications relative to those things that we need to be aware of. So right now we're having conversations with vendors about uh, the programs, and so there may be some budget implications if we are switching programs. Yes. Was it, um, excuse me, apologize for being late. Was it mentioned, Ms. Kane? If it's mandatory, you might just discuss that. And I guess the, 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 the answer to that for The summer school is the one to be mandatory for students who. I, I was asked if I would recommend that, and I do not recommend that. You do not? I do not. Did you explain why? I did. I did. Sure. I did. And sure. I'm happy to have a yeah, one on one conversation. Yeah.
3,224.953 positions. And this is the distribution of those positions. And I know a lot of times there's a perception that uh, there's a lot of money in administration for one thing. And secondly, the other night at the, at the uh, Hale um, community meeting, Dr. Benton asked the audience what they thought the percent of the budget was that was spent on administration. Didn't somebody say 50%? That's in fact uh, 2.4 percent. You'll see that in the upper, going in the middle, right in the square in the middle at the top. Uh, I didn't put the percent on the, on the side margin, but um, I'll add those. But this is giving you the number of positions by the state code, uh, category codes, the eight state category functional codes. On the left side, in the blue shade, is all instruction, and these are building level positions. And there's a, that's another thing. If we look at uh, there's also a pie chart attached to it that shows you that 77% of the positions of 2,488 of the 3,224 are in uh, instruction directly. And those are broken down on the left column from going down, you'll see teachers is the greatest component naturally. Uh, 1,890 teachers, 142 million of the 290 million total budget. That represents 49.1% of the total budget. And those are broken down for you there, showing how many are preschool, elementary, general, middle, and high school classes, exceptional ed and gifted, career and tech ed, other specialty schools, itinerant teachers, which are mostly music, art, PE, and um, two IB coordinators. And so that comes out to 49%. Then you get your paraprofessionals that are in the classroom with those teachers. That's another 193 or $6.5 million, again, broken down by the level that they're serving. Guidance counselor is broken down by level, elementary, middle, high, and specialty. Also, I want to tell you that I did a calculation just for the sake of, of comparing it. The HR uses a staffing standard. You have the RPS standard compared to the state standard. We're using 24 to 1 for elementary, 21 to 1 for um, 6 through 12th grade for staffing the schools. And um, then we also use the K-3 mandate, mandate size. So for the free and reduced lunch schools, based on their level of poverty, the higher the poverty, the lower the class size must be the ratio. So you go that ranges anywhere from 14 to 19 to 1. Using those factors, that generated a number on it, just a formula computation that came within 5.6 positions of that total number of teachers. So that's just to let you know that there is a rhyme and reason to why that number is what it is. It's based on your staffing standards. Okay. And that's why we talk about a modified base budgeting approach too, because we don't start from zero. You have your standards already established. So by applying those standards, that that's what this produces. Um, so paraprofessionals, then guidance counselors, elementary, middle, high, and specialty schools, uh, 64 of those, 5.5 million. Um, instruction student support is homebound, social workers, um, 45 positions there, 3.9 million. Librarians, 44 of them, 3.7 million. The principals, one for each school, uh, 45 of those, 5.5 million. Assistant principals, 61 of those, uh, 6 million, a little over 6 million. School clerical staff that have worked directly in the schools, again, shown by level, 82 of those is $4.8 million. And then uh, I continued on over the, the part of your state instruction category of instruction includes the improvement instruction. Those staff are not in the schools. And so I moved them out from under that column. Um, but you'll see that there's 45 staff ranging from the associate superintendent, Ms. Kane, and all the staff that they who provide the instructional support to the schools and the teachers. And that's across all disciplines for exceptional ed. Well, exceptional ed broke out separately with Dr. Boyd's staff, so you can see that. And but for us, it's, it's all from pre-K to the career and tech ed, um, all disciplines. Uh, that's 45 staff, 4.3 million, and then you've got 18.7 in the exceptional services area, 1.7 million. So the sum total of all instruction, 2,488, make up 63.6% of the total budget. Um, and then going back to the top here, you've got administration with its major functions, the school board, the internal audit, 
superintendent's office, information services, personnel, uh, support services, financial services, and procurement and property management. 70 positions in total, 66.4 million. If you look at the pie chart, that represents 2% uh, of the total allocation. Uh, attendance and health, where you have a director there of the, of the um, family of, uh, and community engagement office, uh, the attendance, parapros, the truancy staff, and clerks uh, for that function. The nurses and the health services area, uh, 34 of those. Uh, nurse assistants, occupational therapists, 13. Uh, got, so 59 people in the health services area. Psychological services, 20 psychologists. Um, and if we're not, if we don't have a psychologist on board, we have vacancies and we use contract services and use some of this money to cover the contract service. So total attendance and health uh, is 131 positions, 8.5 million. Um, and then um, over to the top right corner, you see transportation services with the director, uh, technical staff, clerical staff, the bus driver is 148, bus attendance 45, oh, and two mechanics, 211 staff, $6.9 million, 2.4% of the total. Operation and maintenance, um, the director, supervisor, chief of security, uh, seven staff there, and then you got other technical and fire support. Pardon? Um, just a quick clarifying question. Yes. Does this, is this where we are today, or does this include this <laughs> proposal? This is what's in the estimate of needs. Okay. Including, the, it encompasses the 27 million increase. Okay. And uh, so, so in which this budget has 125.1 increase in the FTE over the current year's budget. And those positions are delineated for you in the PowerPoint that we had last week as part of the presentation. Okay. So total O&M staff uh, with security included in that and uh, custodians. And then down below, those are 10 custodians that are division-wide. Down below, I'll show you what the school-based security staff are. So what's blue with the red lettering um, are school-based custodians, 158 of those. And then you've got security staff, 55 of those in the school. So those are kind of part of your school-based staff. So if you look at school-based overall, and then technology, uh, that's the last category. And school food services, because the charter school has got a new food service manager this year, our food service operation, again, is in a whole separate fund um, that you'll approve separately from the general fund. This is all general fund only. And then we have one, uh, Mr. Kranz has a, a person who's charged with facility services that works on capital projects oversight. Um, so the sum total of all those make up those 3,224. We have another five or 600 positions that are paid for out of grants in addition to this that are contingent upon grant money in those conditions. Uh, so you see 82.4% of this total is in instruction. And uh, then down below, I, I outlined the school-based positions. I recast those down there. So 2,700 of the 3,200 are in the schools working. And I know that's sometimes a big misconception, too. You, you look at one school by itself and you see a handful of personnel, you don't think in terms of it's this many people that are actually in the schools in total for the division. Hopefully that's helpful to kind of put things in context and we'll go to the worksheet. So thank you, Mr. Westway. Um, and this is a general question that perhaps uh, Mr. Prince would like an opportunity to answer as well. Um, in, in, in developing the superintendent's state, state of needs, and after you've been here for, I think you're the real old timer here with the cabinet. Um, are there things, are there ways that we do business or things that we could or should do in this budget that would, one, save money, two, make the system more efficient, uh, and thereby, thereby provide a higher level of service? Well, in terms of the staffing overall, I would say with 600 positions covered over the last five or six years. I'm saying generally, not in a, Maybe it's more from the operation yeah. standpoint. Yeah, let him speak to it. And I know you've already, 
And, I and, and Mr. Krantz, I just want to thank you. You've already offered up, I think, some, some very difficult decisions uh, uh, with some position eliminations, and that has not gone on there. Um, to answer your question, um, there are a lot of things that we can do to improve. Um, for example, in the transportation area, the GPS system should result in us reducing um, the number of routes that we currently are providing out there. While we may not reduce the number of buses because we'll be doing other services, it puts us in a position that we can um, meet the demands, get our children to school on time, get them home on time, and just do a better job of the way we deliver those services and hopefully improve the dollars that are going back into the general purpose fund that can be redirected into the classroom and into other areas. The goal from my group's perspective is finding ways that we can deliver those services that we need to, do it in the most efficient manner possible, and at the, and at the same time not be a burden onto the general purpose fund. Because our, you know, our main objective obviously is to educate the students. What we do is a truly support function, and we can't be the one, while, the, while we have an important job, and each of, each of the folks inside support services do an outstanding job each and every day. The main mission here is to educate those students and give the dollars to what's needed to do that. And so we'll continue to find ways to tweak it. We saw it with the, the proposal. Um, we'll continue to find ways to deliver our services better than we do now. So just to follow up on the GPS and, and other things like that that you proposed, or the superintendent's proposed, for example, the GPS, what kind of net savings are we, are we sort of looking at to do what I think you just suggested, which is allow those savings to be repurposed into the actual classroom? If you look at the cost of a bus on one route, and this is a two-hour route in the morning, two hours in the, in the afternoon, our estimated annual cost of both the driver and the operating expense of that bus is $23,000 a year. That's 180 day school year. So if we can take one bus off, that's $23,000 we bring in. If I can bring 10 buses, obviously, you know, you start talking $230,000. If I can get to the 10% that we saw with the county south here, south of us, that's on the GPS, it's on our routing software that I think does an outstanding job where they saw a 10% reduction in the number of runs that they did. For us, if we could do that across our, our, our run, that's roughly, you know, you look at the, the total, we have 970 routes we run in the morning and the afternoon. 10% is 97, that's 33 buses that potentially Okay, and let me say that, that's potentially, that could, if we were to achieve what they were able to achieve, the potential could come off, of, off the road. Now, are there other needs that we have? Yes. We're not able to meet the needs on field trips that, that's there because we're tied up doing this. Are there other programs that are needed for us to do? Yes. But you're able to take those dollars, thirty-three times $23,000, and bring those over to do other things that meets what Dr. Benton and the academic side need for us to do. Right. From the standpoint of actually reducing costs, though, because in this case is saving to shift. What you have to say is what you all told me. Ours gets down to think the services. Correct. The only way that we believe that we're going to actually reduce costs is decide what type of services we're going to continue to be able to provide. That's where the real challenge becomes. Um, you know, what services are we going to continue to provide, whether the services to staff or the services to students? That's where some of and of course the big one is obviously our facilities. We're the big bank in the book. Mm -hmm. We want to get some home runs hit, major savings. Uh, and then where I was going to the question I asked him was, you know, he's got big 600 positions you told me. Yet we have more students now. All right. Well, 09, so we had fewer students in 09, and our budget still below where we were anyway. So the efficiency part of it, I mean, as far as the staffing goes and meeting and your standards here, then the only way to tweak that and to reduce the cost is to change the service model, the delivery model, amount model, or, and for us, the greatest opportunity we have here is the right sizing the facilities. That's, that's the answer to having the resources necessary to do what's needed to be done here. Talking millions of dollars. 
that. I mean, that's where we would look and compare ourselves to Norfolk and uh, that differential number of students being served in the buildings. That's where our overhead is. There's only so much squeezing he can do on buses and people and custodians. We've got to have so many for so many square feet, and he's already said it. We're maxed out on the square footage for custodians. So cutting any further there isn't going isn't to be effective from the service delivery standpoint. Just one thing. Maybe this is an offline conversation, but first question, the last question, we made some decisions about reduction of overtime for buses, and I think I think it was three categories of employees that we said we're assuming some savings by reducing the amount of overtime we can work by 10%. And I think when we first got here, we found that that hasn't quite come to fruition. Um, Correct. Can it come to fruition? <coughs> or, or is that just sort of water under the bridge where other folks um, felt like they didn't have to abide by the budget and we did that? I do this as a data. Yeah, I understand. Um, if you look at where there was cuts made, one of the key components of it, though, was to, to still use those funds to meet other needs inside that service model. So it was to give more funds into our custodial group so that we could address the new school. I mean, we increased the square footage of the high school by 80,000 square feet with no addition to the number of custodians. Our custodial staff today does 28,000 square feet per person. That's just not going to happen. It's not done on commercial buildings. It's not done on retail uh, centers. And I'm talking about organizations that are state-of-the-art, top-line equipment, and, and they don't expect their staffs to do that. Um, in the, to answer your direct question on transportation, based off of the current schools we have, the bell schedules we have, the routes we're, we're, we have to do, We'll, we will not eliminate um, that overtime component until we find a way to get more efficient and that GPS will go a long way toward that, okay? Now, there's other things we're looking to do that's in that, in that budget um, in transportation. Be more efficient in what we do from a maintenance standpoint. Those 78 buses generated significant savings on an annual basis on the fuel and the, uh, the maintenance to the tune of well in excess of about half a million dollars a year. Changing the way we maintain our whole entire fleet, and there's, I, I don't want to go too public just because of uh, the but there's ways to change that delivery of those services and save significant dollars, and those are projected inside our budget. That's what we're gonna have to do. It's gonna be a penny at a time where we still try to provide a quality level of service, but that's, a, that's the most efficient dollar that we can do. Okay. Rob, do you have anything else that you're gonna um, share with us tonight? Uh, no. All right. Um, what about the spreadsheets we sent in? Is that for another night? Uh, we have the spreadsheet up, and we have had the comments. Uh, that you submitted. <laughs> so, board members, uh, I'm thinking we can adjourn here tonight at eight. Um, so that gives us that gives us another 35 minutes. Um, I I've been in a spreadsheet, and I think Dr. Jones did as well. So I guess we have a couple things. Oh, and Ms. Epps gave them something, yes. right? Yes. So um, that can be a starting point for now to use up our next 35 minutes unless folks want to do something else. Um, can we, can we, this is just my suggestion, when was the spreadsheet, when were you asking for that? Yes, sir. Tuesday.
under enrollment of our high schools across the city in terms of what we're going to do long term, you know, with with. Um, and, and so I know the facilities uh, task force study is coming soon, and I don't know exactly when it's going to come. Um, and I don't know if any of if any of those things that I put on my, my budget worksheet are addressed in there, but I do want to. Um, and that's important because because you know we have to be humanized with state-of-the-art facilities, and you got kids standing on the same bus stop. Some going to humanize, some going to where? You know, if it was me, I might want to jump on the bus for the Um Just because there's been neglect over time, and I know that WIC is not the only school. Um, so I'm willing to couch it in a larger conversation uh, of something, you know, I've had discussions with Mr. Bourne about in terms of, you know, right sizing um, and, and, and in terms of how we do that. The other piece uh, was uh, pre-K on Southside, uh, which we don't currently have, uh, and there's a need for it, there's a desire for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I like that. I like that. So I like that. And so. Um, you know, and I had mentioned that we have the uh, the old road building, the old one as well as the Summer Hill Rough and Road building. Mm -hmm. That that is, that's and both are in my district, and and both are eyesores. Uh, and so, if we were able to do something, we would have to certainly look at you know uh, budget ramifications around that. And then the final piece of it was, um, you know, on the South Side, we're busting at the seams in our elementary schools, and you know that we've had this conversation many different times. Uh, you know, Mrs. Rush and um, this town at Oak Grove and Broad Rock, respectively, are pulling the rabbit out of the hat every day. And and even in Tichy's uh, district over at Green, uh, I believe that they're, they're over capacity or at least at capacity. So we're going to have to look at, once again, this may go into a larger discussion, but I still think that we need to have it of how we're going to alleviate uh, that overcrowding and what, what, what are some options for us to do that and what are cost parameters around it. So those are three big areas for me. Um, that I, if we don't address them in this particular budget that we're talking about, we definitely have to get them on the radar and begin to have a larger discussion because uh, we can't continue the way we're going. Well, let me address them real quick. On the athletic side, I, I fully agree with you. Um, we've worked with the sports backers who have done a tremendous job on both our high school and our middle school in identifying some of the needs and the challenges that we have. The intent was to put that inside and, and we went back and forth, was it in the CIP, would it not be inside the CIP? Um, and so the, I ended up saying I put that inside that facilities task force because it's a rather large number and it does impact the whole discussion of right sizing or, or what facilities, what schools may be built new, what's, you know, all those what if discussions are gonna take place will drive what the total dollars are. And I thought that the CIP should be more focused on what is known today right. and you know, what was that core um, sort of thing. So it's the intent is to put that inside that inside our facilities task force. And it is a significant number on that. Okay. On the the, uh, the use of identifying a pre-K site has been something that Dr. Benton has missioned me since basically the first day I came on board was finding a site that we could do pre-K in the South, because clearly we do not do that today. Um, we are very close to bringing something to the tape to this board. Um, it, it is, it's, it's been a process, and I think this board, I hope, when we make that presentation, we'll be extremely excited uh, about that. And it is a partnership. And I think it's one that you will, I think we'll be very pleased with that opportunity that we'll have. The discussion on um, the elementary schools that we have down there in the South, um, we do have some very significant issues there. Um, but if I took all the elementary, I, I did this just, I got bored, I guess, and I just wanted to see some numbers, you know, um, where we have Broad Rock, Oak Grove, Green, Reed, all are at capacity or significantly over capacity. Just looking at the map and the schools and saying, how do you go about solving the problem? Because to be honest, some of the schools, we don't have the land to put an addition on. 
Um, other schools, we do have the land to put an addition on, but in, the real question that starts driving some of it is, do we have enough of a cafeteria, for example, to support the additional classrooms that come on board? Do we have enough of a bus ramp? Do, you know, those, the infrastructure and the support that's needed for all the students that would go there, do we have that? So, if you took all of our elementary schools in the South, right now, we actually have a net of 248 open seats. Now again, not students all don't fit, so this is just a pure mathematical number, okay? So please take that, you know, in, in advising. Um, so you can see the challenge that, that everybody has in front of us is we are over capacity at those four schools that I mentioned. That's clear. We're going to have to do something for that 2015. Unfortunately, that situation at Elkhart brings in another school that there's difficult discussions that need to be, that we all need to have to develop a plan, and, and it's, it impacts us in 2000, all of these impact us in 2015, 2016. The intent wasn't to delay presenting, it was to finalize some of that enrollment data that we're doing with the outside group. Um, that it should be in my inbox, but unfortunately with everything going on, I'm about three days behind on the email, and I apologize, it's just been, you know, uh, other things. But uh, the intent will be to come back to y'all as a board as quickly as possible with, um, you know, some discussion points and some ideas and have that meaningful discussion, but those are going to have to be done sooner than what we initially, and, and what we initially were just back. And, and, and will those discussions or points or recommendations, will they have, you know, substantial uh, impact on on this budget that we're discussing here? It very much could. Yes, sir. Which is, I don't know. At, at this point in time, until you kind of zero in, and Doctor, I'm going to defer to Dr. Benton, but until you kind of zero in, it's tough to tell you exactly what that impact would be. Okay. It, there's a potential. Uh, a couple of things just happened today in the conversation on the state. Beyond just a normal issue of addressing Elkhart's structural deficits, we now have ended up in a situation where we have to make school improvement decisions because of funding stream, impact on classification and rating. That will come at your February 17th meeting that Janice is working on some things that we just merged. Um, our intent is to bring you, uh, as Mr. Krantz to bring forward, is here is an estimate of if you want to fix the problem, here are some other options that you need to consider. Depending on where you go with that, it could have potential savings that exist uh, with regards to what we do or don't. Okay. As you know, currently you have about 2,000 more seats. In middle school level, our problem is we're stacked at the elementary level. Right? Overall, we're about 9,000. We had high school issue with some elementary schools, not at the max. But you got a pocket that's like most people can see. So part of that conversation, I think, also really at some point need to be you know, pulling rabbits out of the head. And that's where I think Mr. Warren asked me at one point when we stopped by, when you make me clarify the right size, we're talking about means. Right. You know, it's not just closing or it's not just building. It's a, it's a conversation about maximizing existing facilities. In some cases, because where we are possibly reducing the square footage space. Uh, renovation and modernization. It's a bit more comprehensive look rather than the things we shut them there, right? In our case, it's part of the principles. You can right size in, in a district that is using 85% of space and not have to close anything, but you still right size. Right. Because it's your boundaries, it's the use of the current space, it's so we want people to understand that when you said right size doesn't mean the goal is just cut. It's really about effective use right. of the capital. In our case, we got a bunch of stuff that have been corporate. Um, so what I'm getting to it, so we're gonna have to hopefully on March 2nd to be ready to pull the trigger to and what are we gonna do with Elkhart or not? Because we have to go back also to the state now and you know, turn around for the state. Then I'm gonna for three years. Uh, through September 2016. Yeah. 
So but depending on what we do, we've got to renegotiate. Uh, all that piece, a lot of things. Because they, they're part of the school when they got a part scheduled to start. So I've got to back that up now okay. for a couple of weeks because they really can't walk into Clark Park Springs on the first day the kids right. back. They right. need to get themselves together at Clark Springs. Right. Well, that's going to be a disaster with outside person walking when they're trying to get turnaround services. Okay. So we've got a lot of education right. stuff that's now being impacted by the facilities that are So to, to close, I guess, you know, how do we, at what point do we begin to have the discussion about right size and what that means, what that looks like, and how it impacts, you know, our budget, and, and what, what we're going to have to spend, uh, you know, in order to make that happen. Um, and I think that that's a conversation that we have to have, we, you know, relative to the legislation that we put off, I think, in the letter that we sent to council, you know, we, we promised that we would have that conversation. And I don't know if it, it necessarily needs to happen in the context of this, and, I, and I'm willing to stand down on it if, 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 if it's not. But I, I do think that some of the larger challenges that I would like to address in my own district have to do with the right size. They have to do with what comes back from the facilities task force. And, um, and I agree, well, I appreciate so us trying to find savings and efficiency, you know, I, I think that, I really think that we're really going to um, be most efficient when we begin to have that discussion and look at, um, you know, what what we're doing that we shouldn't be doing or what we're not doing that we need to be doing. So, and I, and I would look to your, your you and your cabinet for, for direction on that because I want to make sure we're having the discussion in the right place. You know, I would say that, uh, just to recap, because it's, it's couched in a bigger right. picture. The last slide of the statement of needs trying to lead us there. Yeah. There's only, we're we'll going to send you the document. Okay. One of the things that we tried to give you was a blueprint for mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. On that last page was a link to the road foundation process for school coaching. Okay, right. right. We laid out staffing, all of that type of thing. Okay. Uh, if you want to address the fact that redirecting resources to maximize yes. um, it is a process that really leads you through that decision making process um, so I will go back and send that to you on the record and that is a process that is out for instance one of the things they'll tell you that's not in here that it's working in they say you really should the first year of the process have at least a 0.5 person that's what they focus on rather than being attached to somebody's job, trying to do that one to do another job. Sure. The second year, say, we grow to uh, full time. Mm -hmm. So to get to the fact we're actually going to go through this process and actually have it done, it, it lays out the timetable the old kids can do. Right. So that you can, and then you're able to give the public, say, here's the process you're going to use. It's clear, articulated, um, and that's why I would su suggest that you all look at it start saying, yeah, maybe we need to go ahead and start this and put somebody on it. What is the facility task force you support? Could be available. Yeah. I mean, the original intent was to have it out on February 20th. Um, that's still a goal, but, I mean, understand this this, this move on Clark Springs, right. um, for, 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 us, for us to move everything we've got to do right. um, is our top priority. In, sure. In, sure. Um, it does throw us some curveballs that you know could delay that slightly, but that's our intent, and we're working diligently to still try to make that goal. Yes, ma'am. the last time that? The, the subcommittee is going to meet next week with uh, the data, just to have the we've got um, all the pieces now in place. And remember, our presentation is data, so that you've got a good picture of what is there so you can begin having those discussions on what's the appropriate course of action to take um, and then the intent is the, the week of the 16th let the the full committee of the facility task force where we incorporate any final changes they may want to make incorporate that into it then um, it, as outlined would be to meet uh, with the, the leadership team and, and have the leadership team review it, provide their comments, 
and then at that point in time present it to to, to the board and then join me. That data includes uh, the survey. Okay. Remember we came back on the community perception survey and the facility piece onto it. One is not confused to have to be out there. So it is a segment of it. K-12, the independent third party has done that, so you'll have that perceptual okay. things of how people feel about the buildings, how they feel about closing, how they feel about if they want to pay more money, all that stuff just was in their question. When you're ready, if you would give me an update on the South South UK thing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Mohammed. Um, the question that I had was, um, boy, it just let me myself. I did. I mean, I had it, and then Dr. Jones kept talking. And <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wouldn't, you know. I got it out. Um, all right, were you at me? Yes, yes, Mr. Morning. We'll come back to you. I just want to recognize the respect that most artists supported. Limiting the time that we get to speak, it's Dr. Jones. I think he, uh, he he may have got close to the three minute time. I'm done for that. <laughs> um, mine is less of a question, but more of a statement. Um, I I couldn't agree more with what I think Dr. Jones expressed, which is a willingness and and um, a heightened sense of urgency with which I feel we have to address the right sizing uh, issue. And I think Dr. Redden hit the nail on the head both tonight when we had a conversation about the fact that it's a more comprehensive discussion. It's not closing this school or that school. It's really about taking a, a long-term strategic approach about where we see growth, where we see contraction, uh, what the lines look like, what, what is the best use of our resources. And so um, I just wanted to say to my colleague from, from South Richmond who, um, Got a couple new schools. Now it sounds like it's a preschool, preschool center over there. Um, uh, that that I'm willing to, to stand with you and, and push us to, to have this discussion and and, um, and do what we need to do. It's, good. it's not, as you know, it's not going to be easy. No, no. But uh, but none of us got elected to do the easy things. Right. And we wanted to do the hard work that needed to be done. And the hard work that had gone undone <coughs> for just about a generation. So. I just want to say that to you and commit myself to this work to make sure it happens. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, when I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad. Yes. Um, if the report is expected to be out on the 20th, and I know that's a, a, um, a, a guest date now because of all that has happened this week, we're scheduled to meet with City Council. Oh, on the 23rd <clears throat> and specifically in that subject line was the facilities task force task force report so if you know you think that it's not going to be prepared by the 23rd you know miss lewis or miss larson can we let president mosby know that we may have to you know schedule another day um the second question is and in line with Dr. Jones having high expectations for the South Side, um, we have yet to have a solid discussion on monies that apparently were set aside for a. I'm not loud enough. Is that what you're saying? They can't hear you. Oh, on the video. Oh, on the video. On the video. So we have yet to have a solid discussion about monies that apparently were set aside to. Um, build a new Ogilvy Shepherd Elementary School. The community, which is part of my district and the community that I live in, they are um, anxiously waiting some direction and some communication. So I know there have there have been several meetings um, at Ogilvy Shepherd Elementary School without invitations being sent to Dr. Leonard or the superintendent in terms of um, a new school. I mean, Dr. Benton might have gone, I'm not sure, but I found out after the fact um, on several meetings. So we're just being kept out of the loop a little bit. If we can just get some information, some updated information 
as to what the plan is, what we're going to do, things like that. I don't know. Is that East End stuff? It's part of that the East End transformation project, um, which was so, actually started before the East End right. transformation project. It's, it's, it's the Highland Grove. Uh, you can the, mm -hmm. There is a meeting on Tuesday with um, the council woman okay. from, the, from, from, from your respective district, mm -hmm. um, as well as Ms. Larson will be attending. Okay. Um, that kind of will bring the the twenty third meeting. And I, I know, as she refers to it as the Dove project, the will, be, dis project, will right. be discussed specifically. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, ten more minutes. You all have anything you want to? Great. Okay, and then Taylor. Um, last year, this time, I kind of spoke to building a strong relationship with parks and recreation and um, bringing things like swimming back into our schools. So, that's, um, I'll be presenting all of that, but just to um, maybe if you all have done any research on that or started building any relationships, I guess that would be talking to you, Ms. Hunter, um, building relationships with parks and recreation because of the facilities that we have. How many um, in house? Who do we have? Mm -hmm. are, are you, have you been working today on that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Between the partnership. Our, our partnership with Parks and Rec. We actually, the school system actually has one that went at Swansboro, even though we, you and I both would think more Parks and Rec. And then we have the one at, uh, at, at uh, the Broad Rock. Broad, Broad Rock has a small one. So there's the right center. The right center. Yeah. So there's three yeah. that I can count off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, there's a strong partnership between Parks and Rec and obviously can be expanded. Um, and I know that under Dr. Bed's leadership and, and he works very collaboratively, which we all do with, with Parks and Rec, they are trying to find ways to expand the program. I mean, for example, what we do um, with evening meals that Parks and Rec does with some of their programs during the year. Um, doing things during the summer where we provide transportation uh, for, for children to get to some of the activities that Parks and Rec does. I know that they're continuing to find ways to try to find more ways to park, but I don't know of anything specific that we yeah. have been uh, recently. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mary, we're trying to update him on you. First of all, this has been like, how long? Ages. Mr. Merrifield, he's the director of Parks and Rec. Okay. Ages outdated. Uh, but I have to be honest, one of his challenges is, if you see on our screen, we show what it is, and he's been flat. Right. It is funny. Um, so he stretched really, really thin, uh, but we're working to try to figure out how to maximize uh, capacity. Uh, okay. uh, they were one of the people at the table we were talking about how do we close the gap with uh, four and a half. Uh, but I also know that, and I've said it to him, Sherry, so now I Versus quality in there, sir. That, that um, he's a, and no disrespect to him because I think the desires here, the flat ground and the resources makes it hard because they're one of the most important. They're like to weigh $100 per year. Mm -hmm. uh, $50 each semester. Uh, so, but uh, uh, we continue to talk. Um, we all had to move an event for the football games, the Armstrong issue. Uh, they blink it out. Call him and play on the movement to the neutral site. So he's very collaborative and he's strained really, really good. So that's one of the things he's trying to overcome. When he continues to try to find a way to play again. And then Rub Daddy I think he's back in the middle of the office. Is there any way that we can probably pick up on this last? You know, he's not going to say he's going to pay for something, no. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I just, I just look at the statistics and I'm saying that our children, that the research that I'm looking at shows children of color, those are the highest rates of drowning. But I do know with PE, excuse me, Robert, we do do something already in physical education. I know it's been taken off. Second grade. Oh, yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, I know um, on that secondary level, those kids are getting a lot of exposure if they 
they sit on the elementary school level. So we can see what that would look like, uh, what the cost would possibly be, and all that it would entail. Okay. Well. Oh. Oh, yeah. Then one other thing, I, I haven't dissected the budget. I got real, but um, do we have a, a line item that will allow for additional resources like calculators in certain schools? I was talking to. Um, Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars increase in school supplies. Okay. Perfect. 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 Yeah. So I won't say it's enough, but you put. Is that is there a separate allotment for um, Title One schools versus non? That is general fund. Title One is federal. Please, where it is, but we added seven hundred fifty thousand additional dollars on the budget. It's already there. It's a starting point because they've been you know, they've been flatlined for years. That was one share we all that Betsy and the team tried to meet with the schools to get more input. Mm -hmm. Only some kind of responded. Some of that is people think a lot involved for years and have got anything. So we added money regardless to try to bolster that. And if it stays in, they will go to form and get to disperse it. Because our goal is to get to a system that's also about the needs of the student. Yeah. So that's everybody right. right to get the same. So version of the way the student form the process. Okay, that's wonderful. Because um, the teacher I was talking to today was saying how they sometimes um, non Title One schools have to borrow those type of things from Title One schools, especially when they're getting ready to start the um, SAT testing for Virginia. Of okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. And I'll share the website. All right, board members. Um, so those of you who have not completed the budget spreadsheet and and you want to, um, send it to Mr. Westbag by what? Give us a deadline. <coughs> Meeting again next Thursday. Yes. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday night, Monday morning. <laughs> Come on, throw, throw it down. We'll make it work. <laughs> Sunday. But that's not, I'm sorry, that's not okay. I, I have it to your Monday. Okay. Okay. Monday will work. Being realistic. You could keep it real. Sunday, 12 hours. I'm at the office, anyway. All right. Yes, it's, it's easy to use. Yes, for friends. Do you okay. want to cover Mr. Westbank? Uh, do you have questions about this? Uh, it's, 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 it's so easy. I don't even know. Just so quickly. Okay. okay. This is the spreadsheet up here. It's, it's, it looks a little bit like a lot like the one from right up here. But on this side, you've got the, um, we listed all the position initiatives up here. So the budget is recapped right here on the upper left quadrant. And it shows you how we break it out getting from the current year is $262,594 million budget. And then all the changes are listed there for the $27 million. And that reconciles to the new $290 million number here. And then over here on the next quadrant on the upper right side is all the position changes. It's all the initiatives tied to the positions with that uh, okay. 125.1 total increase. And then on the bottom half of it is all the uh, non staff personnel changes. So where again, do you with all the initiatives. So the last step thing, that's what I think is. Okay. And then there's also backup sheets that was sent with that email that will cross-reference all those things so you can read the detail. If you want to know what's in that item, then there's detail behind there to tell you what's in there. And then when you get the spreadsheet, it's going to be locked. You won't be able to go to any cell except for the yellow ones. And we're asking you to put a yes or no in there. And if you put a yes in, it shows that item's funded and it adds to the bottom line. If you put a no, it decreases the difference of the 27 million. And we put we flagged the several of them with the red M next to them, which just means that there's quasi mandate kinds of items we don't have a whole lot of choice about. And to show you that if we did that, at a minimum, the bottom line, the balance, it's a running balance over here, you'll see it on the front sheet right here. That's a running gap, 
number there with the $27 million. But this is saying that the gap, if you just did those things, the minimum would be $6.7 million that we'd be requesting if you did that. So under the school board, I, I just like to keep it simple for me. Right. Under school board additions, that's why I add and you got another page over there where you can put things for reduction, a okay. section for reduction, and, and a section. section for addition. Okay, that's thank you. That's it.